Have you thought this through? No way will that work. Are you sure? Is there any money in that? You'll okay. never make any money doing that. How are you going to pay the mortgage? Just get a job. Are you going to try and tell that? Why can't you be normal like everybody else? All right. Were your parents normal too? The savvy entrepreneur to the rescue. Congratulations. That really turned out well. I wish I had the courage to follow my dreams. Hey, good morning out there. Welcome to the Savvy Entrepreneur. We are broadcasting live from WLCB 101.5 FM from the greater Chicago, Milwaukee area. I am your host, Doris Nagel. And why am I here? because I am a crazy entrepreneur myself, and I love helping other entrepreneurs. I've counseled lots of startups and small businesses over the past 30 years as part of my law practice and advisory services, but I've also helped start or started on my own at least nine different businesses, and I can tell you I have made plenty of mistakes along the way. So my passion is to share what I've learned, find other experts and entrepreneurs to also share their advice, their insights, and their stories. We have two goals here at The Savvy Entrepreneur, to share helpful information and resources, but also to inspire and hopefully make your journey as an entrepreneur faster and easier. I always welcome questions, comments, call-ins. Contact me if you wanna be a guest on the show, you know of a great resource at dnagel, N-A-G-E-L, at lakesradio.org. Trust me, the show will be better for your input because this show is about you. So without further ado, I would like to introduce our guest for today. Our topic is borrowing money and specifically what lenders look for when businesses like yours or mine come looking for money from the bank. And with us, we are delighted to have live in our studio today to talk more about that, Wendy Bash, who is the Director of Commercial Lending at BCU. Wendy's a very experienced commercial lender. She's got more than 30 years experience in the banking industry. Prior to BCU, she was at a number of different lending institutions, including Alliance Credit Union, Ridgestone Bank, Charter One Bank, First Midwest Bank, GE Capital, and others. She's a graduate of the University of Michigan Dearborn with a degree in business management, and she's also a licensed mortgage loan officer. She also devotes time to her community, serving as treasurer of St. Margaret's School and a volunteer at Algonquin Lake in the Hills Food Pantry, among other volunteer activities. So just a word about BCU. BCU is a local credit union focused on serving customers and home to almost 250,000 members. I will let Wendy talk a little bit more about BCU in just a second, but I want to say first of all, Wendy, thank you so much for being our guest today. Welcome. Thank you, and thanks for having me, Doris. Wendy, talk a little bit about what is BCU? What is it exactly and how did it come to be? Great question, Doris. BCU is a, as you said, a local not-for-profit credit union headquartered out of Vernon Hills. BCU started in 1981 uh, when a group of executives in the healthcare industry elected to establish a credit union for the convenience of the industry's employees. And actually, that's a theme that rings true even through today. We continue to partner with great companies, almost 100 of them, as a matter of fact, and we offer our services and products to their employees. I know BCU, so full disclosure here, I am a BCU member and have been a part of what was originally known as the Baxter Credit Union because I was a Baxter Healthcare employee at the time, and I've remained a loyal member ever since because I can attest that the bank provides great personalized service to people. But I believe as Baxter spun off companies, so I went went with Allegiance Healthcare back in 
1996, I think, when Baxter kind of split in half. And so I know BCU at that time said, well, you were a Baxter Credit Union member and we want all of the Allegiance people to be Baxter Credit Union members if you want to be, and offered that service. And then uh, eventually uh, Allegiance was acquired by Cardinal Health and then that was opened up to Cardinal Health. And of course, Baxter has had uh, and numbers of spin-offs and various companies that have then gone on to merge and join with other people. So that's true. We have these seg groups that I mentioned earlier, uh, select employment groups, aren't just healthcare industry. But you're right. That's that's the big foundation of our seg groups. BCU was formerly known as Baxter Credit Union, and we rebranded about a year ago. Well, that makes sense. Uh, in fact, I did a long-term project at CDW, and I was amazed to find out CDW is a BCU partner. So, obviously, that's not a healthcare company either. Yeah. So, and Target, Target is another great company wow. that works with BCU. Fantastic, another great company. So, who can be a member? So we actually have a couple of different ways to become a member at BCU. Um, Our eligibility starts with our footprint. So we have six collar counties around Cook, including Lake County, McHenry, DuPage, Kane, Cook County north of 95th Street, and also Kenosha County. Well, that is our listening area because we are sitting here in Lake County and our listening area ranges up into Kenosha County and also parts of McHenry County at times. We have other ways that you can also gain membership eligibility where if you work for any one of our employment groups, you can also become a member or if you have family members who are members, that would also gain you membership. What are some of the advantages of belonging to a credit union like BCU? Well, one distinct advantage is once you become a member, no matter if you move out of state, you are always a lifetime member. Some other benefits include, because we're not for profit, everything we do is for the members. And so that affords us the ability to offer low rates, low fees, and higher dividends and more innovative products than you would find in other financial institutions. Well, and I can say from personal experience that I know that sometimes people wonder if your friendly neighborhood bank actually still exists, but I would have to say that when it comes to BCU, and I'm not promoting BCU, but I'll just say from my personal experience, it's a very friendly, very personalized kind of service that I don't think most of the larger banks are able to offer. Do you agree with that? I completely agree. In fact, it takes me way back to what I recall as community relationship banking. I mean, they are very serious about building those relationships with members. And our whole purpose is to empower people to discover financial freedom. And they take that very seriously by by guiding our members. It's not just what's good for BCU, it's truly what's good for the business and the members. And they are, they're very caring and very friendly and everything is really around the member first experience. So that should be music to ears for those of us in the community who are businesses because sooner or later, most businesses need a bank account and there's a decent chance that they're gonna need money at some point in time. So what kind of business loans or credits does BCU provide to businesses, for example? So we have a whole suite of loans to cater to the business member, and that includes business credit cards, lines of credit, which are both secured and unsecured, term loans and commercial real estate loans. What are the most common reasons that businesses apply to BCU for a loan? So a large part of our portfolio is commercial real estate, both owner-occupied and non-owner-occupied, but I do see a lot of requests for small businesses that are looking for, maybe they want to take advantage of some inventory purchases and get a discount, and so they want to buy that maybe off-season, so they'll apply for a line of credit. I see a lot of term loan for equipment purchases, which are all can be very smart to add to your business, especially if you're manufacturing something and you want to create more products and grow to the next level. Well, so now here's the key question: is what what are you 
and other commercial lenders at BCU looking for when you decide whether to issue credit to a business or how much credit? Sure. Well, we're looking for businesses that really have been operating for at least three years and have at least two years of profitability. I understand there's a need out there as well for startups. That just isn't our space, but there's certainly a lot out there to help a startup business. We would like to see... Well, hold, hold that thought, because sure. I want to ask you a little bit about that. I know that's not BCU's sweet spot, mm-hmm. but I also know that with 30 plus years in the banking industry, you are a fountain mm. of information when it comes to all different kinds of lending. So hold that, uh, yeah. we'll hold that thought and come back to that. Okay. So we, we are looking for members who have been keeping their credit good above 650 and who have a passion for their business and can tell us not only how they got in business or why, but where they're going and how they're going to get there. Interesting. What are the typical things, you, the mistakes that you see when businesses come to you wanting money? What are some of the most common mistakes? So a lot of mistakes are not having seen or looked at your credit in a while and maybe there's some unpleasantness in there (laughs) (laughs) that they haven't addressed. I also see sometimes there are economic and environmental factors to a business where the borrower maybe hasn't considered the the impact on, on the long term. So give me an example of that. For example, if somebody came to me and were looking to invest in a big box mall Big box meaning like... Well, that's probably not a good idea. Right, anyway. exactly. But, well, we'll put that aside for a minute. Well, it's it's choosing the right product, right, and the right business and the right service for the times. I mean, you're, you know, a lamp lighter isn't going to come get a loan from you. There's no lamps to light. You know what I mean? I'm going kind right. of way back. Right, right. A horse and buggy. Right. You know, yeah. Uh, business. Right. Whip, know. whip makers, you know, yeah. <laughs> with a horse well, and buggy. <laughs> movie rental. Right. So that sort of thing. Yeah. So understanding government, even government restrictions on business or even business owners who maybe don't realize that our industry is regulated. And so they are always wondering why so many questions, why so much paperwork? Because, you know, we we get audited and we have regulations that we have to follow. So, you know, there's a reason why we're asking for certain things. Well, so I want to dive deeper into that because I think that's pretty interesting. I, fair disclosure, I've never actually borrowed money for business purposes before, but I certainly have from a residential perspective. And I know I was surprised to learn, and fortunately my loan officer was kind enough to educate me on a number of requirements because I said, well, that doesn't make sense. I don't see why I have to have this or that, you know, typical right. typical lawyer pushing back, trying to, you know, negotiate the system, you know, and he very kindly and gently told me, I wish I could help you here, but we're regulated and there are certain thresholds and ratios and certain requirements that need to be met. Talk a little bit about what some of those kind of requirements are that maybe businesses would run into or or maybe might even be surprised by. Sure. I think the most recent change in regulation requires lending institutions to obtain at every loan request and every product request a uh, certification of ownership of the business. So even if the member has been with us for a while and we know it and they ask for a new product, we have to get this form. Wow. Yeah. So well, that's a pain. It is kind of a pain. And, and of course, they're thinking, well, you, you know me so well. Why do well, I have right. to fill you're this my, out? You're my neighborhood bank. You're supposed to be personal and friendly. How can yeah. you not know this? Exactly. Right? Exactly. But, you know, auditing requires us to keep those forms on file and, and, and we get audited on those forms uh, all the time. So what are some of the other kinds of federal requirements? Because I I think people who borrow money don't always understand which things are bank driven and which are actually driven by regulations that you just can't get around. Well, first of all, consumer versus business are two totally separate worlds. You're going to have a lot more consumer regulations than you would on a business side. So back to the question about yeah. some of the regulatory requirements. Are, are there 
like ratios or oh yeah so talk a little bit about see i think that's probably a foreign world to most okay so especially small business people and solopreneurs or you know onesie twosie threesie kind of businesses that haven't been through this before sure so those aren't actually going to be federal regulations those are going to be by the institution and their personal lending policy oh so one primary ratio metric that we use on all loans is our debt service coverage ratio and and most business owners if they've applied for a loan are, are familiar with that term okay so this is your net operating income divided by the debts you're going to have to pay over the next year and that ratio including the loan payment including the potential payments. loan okay. payment and that right. should a healthy ratio would be north of 1.25 to 1 okay so kind of think of it as um 1.25 more a dollar of income versus dollar for debt right gotcha yeah so you should be making some profit even after you make the loan payments make the loan payments absolutely so what are some things that you've seen most commonly that cause businesses to not be able to meet those kind of thresholds what i see a lot is people who maybe haven't aligned themselves with a good lender and have taken on an enormous amount of debt that is of high interest rate. Wow. So, you, you know, mean like credit card debt or? or credit card debt, it could be non-bank lenders just to get by. They maybe went to that source because there was a great need and they needed to have it in a hurry. There there could be a number of reasons for that. But if you're really venturing into business, you should probably sit down and look at your cash flow or get familiar with how cash flow works on a you know weekly or even daily basis that's going to be key for you to control your profitability and what you need to do in your business how much sales you're going to need to generate your profit margins and how to control your expenses do most business owners who come to bcu do you find that they have a good working knowledge of that or is that something that you end up coaching them a little bit on yeah you know we we have the whole gamut we we get some more sophisticated and less sophisticated business owners and we guide them along the way if if they don't know about it so how do, how do you do that just the individual loan officers are are coached to help the businesses go through that process sure we take an in-depth look at their financial statements have a dialogue with the owner to understand the events that impacted those numbers so that we can really guide them and show them kind of what might be obvious to us. Have, have you considered you know, these options? Have you considered cutting that night shift? Or so you're, you really venture even into almost business consulting on some of the questions, really looking at the business from a holistic perspective, it sounds like. Yeah, on a, on a small scale, yes. Are most of the loans that you issue secured or unsecured? So our loans are mostly secured, although we do offer an unsecured line of credit as well as a business credit card. Neither of those have um, hard collateral securing them. What kinds of things do you take as security typically? So we'll take accounts, uh, receivable equipment, inventory, even cash or a CD or commercial or real estate and each of those will have a different factor on how much we can lend against those based on our policy and what about unsecured loans how do you decide when somebody comes to you and they don't really have inventory because obviously more and more businesses these days are service related and i, I don't mm -hmm. you know i i don't know how do you take how do you I guess you could take accounts receivable, but yeah. so even that gets to be a little unpredictable for some service businesses. Sure. So then we would have to turn to the cash flow of the business. How strong is it? How strong has it been? Is it trending in the right direction? And then we would look to the guarantors to see what their personal credit looks like. And if it's strong and the cash flow is there to support the repayment of the loan, then we can feel comfortable about going into an unsecured loan. So what kind of business makes the best client for you? I mean, what kind of skills should they have? What kind of experience or 
expertise or just knowledge that they have to really be a good client for you. Sure. And it's not even a good client, but you want them to be successful. So you have to be a little savvier today than you used to be. Yeah. Um, you how, have to, how so? Well, you have to do your homework. You can always tap into a commercial lender that's in your local lending institution. They are a wealth of knowledge to get you. Well, hopefully they are. Anyway. Yeah. But you you want to come to the table with full disclosure and you want to be truthful in what you're presenting, right? There's nothing worse or nothing that'll kill a deal faster than if the lender finds out that you have an IRS tax lien or they find out that you have a pending litigation. Right, so you or you got to have a story or two here. So share with me, I didn't know names and sure. faces. From all the years of your experience, a couple of things where you found businesses, I'm sure thought that they were kind of like packaging their home for sale, you know, mm-hmm. kind of, they want to put it in the most positive light possible. So what? tell me a couple of stories of one, the things sure. that you've found or you've had colleagues find okay. that were surprises. Well, even recently, a few months ago, we, we were ready to close a deal and the title came up and there was an encumbrance on title because there was a judgment ens- entered against this borrower for a slip and fall. And in my experience, I've seen a lot of nuisance slip and fall cases, but when I called the member, they indicated, we have no idea what you are talking about, which is unusual. So they really didn't. They really didn't. And I thought, how could you not know when a judgment is entered against you? Well, it turns out that they had an old attorney represented as the, as the contact under the secretary of state. Okay. And all the notifications were going to that old attorney and the old attorney was not i don't know what they were doing with that information but they they weren't making our member known that sounds like a disciplinary action from an attorney perspective yeah but anyway and so when they didn't show up to court a judgment was entered oh my goodness yeah so what happened how we were able to navigate around that was we worked with the title company and we said look here's what we think the actual monetary damages would be or could be and we agreed to hold back about a hundred and twenty thousand in escrow with the title company until that matter was resolved fortunately they were able to get their attorney involved get it all you know, squared away within you know a month wow. and get that money back but you know you just there's so many moving parts when you're when you're closing a loan that you know these things come up and more right. importantly, we didn't walk away. We were right. able to navigate through it and make it work still. So. Well, and also in this case, it was something that the business owner didn't even know about. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure, you know, those of you who have borrowed money or tried to buy or sell a house have found some of the same kinds of things where you're like, what? That doesn't make any sense. But of course, then everything slows to a screeching halt until it's all resolved. Yeah. So there have got to be a couple of stories, though, of ones oh, yeah. where the business owner thought they were doing themselves a favor by not quite coming clean with oh yeah so i also have years of workout experience too so i have plenty of cases of deliberate fraud where you know we were working with somebody for years and looking at their books and actually this was uh, back kind of back a few years ago 10 or more and the borrower was actually had two sets of books and what? yeah and I thought that only happened in like third world <laughs> country or something nope still still happens and at that time that that kind of loan was for inventory so boat inventory specifically and so that inventory has a tendency to move around a bit right oh, yeah, yeah that's so right. so we saw all kinds of scams about you know Oh, we'll give you free shrink wrap if you bring your boat back so that when the bank comes and they they count the inventory your boat's there but it's really sold and unpaid so you know wow i've seen lots of different examples right. and i have more <laughs> these are great stories Just yeah. to, these fall under the heading of believe it or not yeah right? but i do want to say that even with all those years of workout i i want to say that 99 percent of borrowers want to do the right thing and they do the right thing to the best of their ability well so there's probably a gray area in the middle okay so there's the the schemers and the scammers and those people any bank that finds out about them whether it's bc or any bank is going to want to run for the hills Mm -hmm. because these people are 
you don't know what to trust on them. And then there's the ones on the other end of the spectrum, which are things that the, the borrower didn't have any clue about, literally, sincerely, and honestly, until the whole process, the due diligence process, came, it came to light. There's got to be stuff in the middle, though, where people just think that they're painting a rosy picture, but oh, yeah. not really helping themselves. <laughs> that explains pretty much every oh. projection financial statement. Well, there you go. <laughs> you know? There you go. Um, yeah, over optimistic, you know, representations of where the company is going to go. I think one skill is to be realistic about, you know, your industry and your business. Coming to me and saying, I know I've had three years of losses, but I just feel like this is going to be a great <laughs> year is not sufficient enough to support, you know, a projection. I mean, you really got to know your industry, know what's going on, and really have some basis and assumptions built in, right, to where you're going. Yeah. But you're right. I mean, if if, if a lender is going to fraud you, I mean, they're, and deliberately, they're going to they're going to find a way to do it. And and we try to prevent against most of that, and that's why we have all these regulations and these policies. But for the most part, if you come with full disclosure and you tell us up front some of that hair on the deal, we could probably navigate it rather than try and hide it or push it under the rug. So what does the borrowing process look like? I mean, how long does it usually take? And what are some of the kinds of things that you ask and that a, that a potential lender should pretty much have lined up before mm-hmm. they come to you? Sure. That's a great question. Um, and what I would recommend to all the listeners who are going to go into a bank and ask for a loan is have this kind of in your arsenal. Three years of business tax returns, if available, or three to five years of projections. Be prepared to say what you base those projections on, include all of your assumptions. Three years of personal tax returns, a personal financial statement, which just says what your assets and your debts are personally, and what your personal tangible net worth is. Know your personal credit score, and be prepared to explain any ugliness that appears there. Include your resume or a bio, a brief paragraph about you and your history and why your experience is lending to this request. Um, And then if you're a startup, have a business plan. I saw that you had a guest speaker that talked about SBA recently. We had a couple of guests who've talked about business planning, including the Illinois Director of the Small Business Administration, who you probably know they they are passionate about planning and we actually had a guest a couple of weeks ago talking about growing business value that gets a common theme here there's been a lot of common themes through our guests actually but one of his points was to really keep growing the value of your business you need to have a business plan and a business plan that's not a binder that you stick on the wall, but literally a live document that's updated fairly regularly that has both short-term and medium-term objectives. It's not a five-year growth plan that you come up with some crazy assumptions, whatever you can at the moment, and then you stick it on a shelf. It needs to be a living, breathing document. And the point that both of those speakers made is that the quality of the business thinking that goes that comes out of that it's so obvious which business owners have actually been through that process and make it a living breathing process versus ones that put it on a shelf it's not the document it's the process and the business owners that go through that process and keep that fresh and current are head and shoulders above where the others are was kind of their observations. Yeah. That, that I agree wholeheartedly. That? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it is something that's ever evolving and you have to be looking at, at your performance, your cash flow on a really on a daily basis so that you can make those changes to that living, breathing document. But there's so many changes that happen so quickly. I mean, certain industries, who would have guessed, for example, that the big malls mm-hmm. you know how, where, where when did that transformation happen it happened fairly quickly really yeah from being a very vibrant kind of place to be to everybody talking about how they're going to redevelop their malls yeah um 
you know, movie rentals, that, you know, that whole industry has, has changed. Taxis with Uber and Lyft, yeah. I mean, the industry changes that you need to keep up with and competitors of figuring out where unlikely competitors might come from is a constant process. It is. I mean, the technology behind all those things that you just mentioned are, have been huge contributors to those changes, right? Online purchasing, right. Uh, less bricks and mortar stores, but right. they're finding, you know, I've read a lot more articles lately that bricks and mortar aren't going to go away in total. People still want to go in and try it on and touch it and feel it. Yeah. So even though they'll reduce, I doubt that they'll ever go away completely. Right. right. There's certain, I, just for me personally, there's a, there is a different experience that goes into walking into a candle shop or a you know a shop that sells lotions and bath products that you can touch and put on your skin or smell I mean, online experience is never going to replace that absolutely not it's very tactile yeah yeah i agree and there are a lot of other ones too but those are just ones that i hope the, the those kind of shops never go away because I would miss that experience. Yeah, me too. And, and there's other changes too, obviously. I mean, you alluded to government changes. There's always regulatory changes that seem like uh, they can affect a business, whether it's interest rate changes or if you're sourcing from places like China, trade regulations and tariffs and taxes and things like that that are always changing, right? Absolutely, yeah. We see a lot more importing businesses, so heavily, obviously, would be impacted by those trade regulations. We touched on this earlier, but I know you've had experience with other kinds of lending. What are, what are some of the things that startup businesses or borrowers that don't meet your criteria. What are some other things that they should maybe think about in terms of getting ready to eventually get a bank loan? So if you're not quite bankable yet, there's some things you can do to kind of prepare yourself. So for example, in this last month, I probably had four requests from borrowers who didn't qualify either because of their credit rating or their cash flow, their business cash flow. But we were able to get them just some experience. So we put some money in an account, a CD, like an interest bearing CD, and use that as collateral to give them a secured credit card or give them a secured line of credit where we can you know, give them exactly how much they've put in. So that just gives them some experience so they can get down the road, let the business season, let them get to where they need to as far as cash flow and as far as their credit scores and then be able to open kind of the, the gates at that point to something more without collateral. So you know, without promoting competitors though, what, are there other kinds of products that they ought to maybe think about Sure. as a place to start if they're just yeah. getting started or they don't, they don't meet your threshold? Sure, there's plenty of lenders like um, Cabbage and Lending Tree, Loan Builder. These are non-bank traditional, non, non-traditional lenders where well, what does that mean non-traditional lender so they're they're not a bank or a credit union oh so they're not governed by the fdic or the ncua well that must be nice yeah but i guess that means <laughs> they probably, need to be very careful they do they do and and these that i mentioned are more credible or ones that i've seen for a long time and i've heard experience from other borrowers that you know they're they're pretty legit you know so there's, there's a lot out there so i would be wary do a lot of research if you are going to do that but the, but these lenders are really known for quick cash you know short term is good for a short term borrow borrowing right. they're not pawn shops but... right right <laughs> I guess you can do that too, but yeah but you do want a grandmother's diamond ring right I mean, no, no. <laughs> But you, you want to be cognizant that make sure that your cash flow can bear it, right? And you don't want to get buried under an enormous amount of debt that you'll never get out from under. So I, I would be wary of that. And then factoring companies, which would take your accounts receivable, do an analysis on your account receivable and be able to give you some cash flow that way. Mm -hmm. um, but they would have a lien against those receivables, which is yeah. not unusual. Even if I, as a, as a traditional lender, were to do a term loan secured by your receivables, I too would have a lien against them as well. Yeah. So I, I, do, I do see a lot of graduation, let's say, out of factoring where they want a lower rate. So conventional lenders will typically be lower in rate. Factoring is going to be a little bit higher. 
So it's kind of like the state of Illinois. Yeah. <laughs> when your credit rating's kind of poopy, you, you're going to end up yeah. paying a lot of money and yeah. more money in debt to pay a higher interest rate. Yeah. But if you're more like Minnesota, who seems to be able to manage its fiscal situation a little better than Illinois, they pay less money when right. they borrow money. Right. And find more people who want to loan them money. Yeah. Right. So, you know, I, I came prepared to talk a little bit about SBA because that's that's a great vehicle, especially for, you know, startups or let's say restaurants aren't as appetizing for most local lenders. That a, that's a bad pun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, you know, for the SBA, that could be okay. You know, so SBA is so, a great vehicle. So just to rewind really quickly. So BCU... I believe you told me offline is not an SBA lender. We are not. That is not our space. But coming, but there are SBA lenders. There out are, there. and you can visit uh, sba.gov, okay. and you can have. There's a find a lender vehicle in there, okay. as well as how to guides. They have training and webinars that tell you everything on how to how to find even investors, how to build oh, a plan. There, wow. it's, it's a wealth of information. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. And I did want to mention SCORE, which is a yeah, nonprofit. We had, a, you know. we had a, one of the senior SCORE volunteers. Fabulous. On, and they are a great resource, too. Yes, yes. And SCORE.org is where you can find more yeah. resources like that. And they have free workshops, online courses, the whole bit. Yeah, they do. Yeah. And those, you know, the, the people in SCORE are generally seasoned veterans who have been through business and, and know the ups and downs and can really, really help. And, and they're an all-volunteer organization, a nonprofit volunteer organization. So yeah. it's not like you have to worry about writing a big check for their consulting services because they don't charge it. So. Yeah, that's very nice. So I know in the past you've worked for lenders who issue SBA loans. Mm-hmm. How are the guidelines for SBA loans, just generally t- speaking, are they different than commercial lenders use? They are. So commercial lending has, um, again, is going to be dictated through their individual policies on what kind of properties they do and what their advance rates are. Um, the SBA has very, very specific guidelines. You can actually see those guidelines under their standard operating procedures right oh, on wow. SBA.gov. Okay. So you can see exactly what they're looking for. What qualifies? So what, is, what are some kinds of things that an SBA loan would be looking for maybe that a commercial lender like BCU is or isn't looking for? Well, you're going to have a little bit of a higher rate, right? Because the nature of an SBA loan is that they provide a guarantee to the lender, which makes right. that loan more palatable. Right. Um, so in exchange for that, you're going to pay a little bit of a premium. Right, but you're going to have a longer fixed term loan, so you'll get a better rate at a conventional loan. I think really it's very, very similar because the SBA will tell you too, we want you to implement your prudent lending practices on SBA loans as well. So you really should be using very similar guidelines. But the SBA, I know, requires that if there is collateral available, you have to take it no matter what it is until you meet the loan criteria. That and, might be a little eye-opening. Yeah, yeah. Too. So if you have equity in your home and there's no other collateral, they're gonna they're gonna want that second. Ouch. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you know, it's a give and well, take. This is, this is why we're chatting, and yeah. I think it's interesting is that people who haven't been down that path before need to fasten their seatbelts a little bit mm-hmm. and maybe even look in the mirror a little bit to understand how committed they are to their business. Yeah. SBA also, at the time when I was doing it, they were requiring life insurance from the guarantors as well, which is not something I would see on the conventional side. Interesting. Yeah. We've talked about the application process. Talk about what makes businesses most successful in repaying the the loans that they've gotten. Because, you know, the last thing anybody wants, whether you're a business owner, and certainly the bank doesn't want to see it. I mean... I'm thinking of a neighbor I had up close and personal. He had a carpeting business and mortgaged the house to the hilt and the business just didn't end up making it and they ended up having the bank foreclose in the house. Nobody wants to go there. Yeah. So how 
how do you avoid those kind of things? What are the common mistakes businesses make once they have credit? And what separates the successful ones from the ones that are, you know, he- head off in a direction nobody wants to see? Sure. Great question. So I think a lot of businesses or business owners get into trouble with the business. They, they kind of panic a bit. They, they start pulling from private resources, personal resources, their 401k. They start blowing through all of that before they pick up the phone and have a conversation with their lender to say, hey, I'm seeing warning signs in my business. My cash flow is short. I don't know if I'm going to be able to you know, meet my obligations down the road. If you do see those warning signs, I highly encourage you to pick up the phone, call your lender, let them look at the financials, let them hear what you're saying, and see if they can't help you right the ship, so to speak, or at least get you some resources to to get where you need to go. So what are the kinds of things that a bank might be able to help do besides give advice? I mean, do you restructure loans? Do you yes. look for secondary financing? I mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, we could definitely do all of those things. If it's something that we can't truly help with, we will try and find other resources. But we do try to try to look at it and see if we can do it ourselves. I just did a loan recently where I refinanced a couple a couple of SBA loans and and honestly the cash flow difference for this member is 25,000 a month. I mean that that's huge. How how is that even possible? Well, because we took a deep dive look into the business, into the assets and we were able to do a loan and conventional loans are going to be a little more affordable than an SBA loan. So we were able to get him out of the SBA loans. He was ready to graduate, so to speak. Yeah. And how impactful. I mean, for me, that is so satisfying to be able to truly help a business like that. I mean, that's a I game mean, changer. He, probably, he or she probably didn't believe it at first. It was probably like, how is this even possible? Yeah, well, that's possible because, you know, BCU is able to have some flexibility and really look and understand on a deeper level, I think even, the member and that business and, and take and, and make a recommendation. So, one thing I would say is people should make sure they pay their bills on time. That's yeah. that's a big one. Auto pay is a good thing. It usually. is a good thing. Try not to continue to let your retained earnings go negative. Keep adding to the value of that business. So how so how would how might you go about doing that? Well, we see a lot of distributions to owners. Oh. And so, you know, I would be cautious and leery of that. So eat mac and cheese if you well, need to. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe on a reduced scale. You well, that goes to an actually a very interesting discussion that a couple of the past speakers talked about, which is the commingling of personal yeah. with business and how that affects the profitability of a business. Is that something you've seen too? Absolutely. I see it all the time. Is that a good thing? Is that... An inevitable hey, thing? It's is a that... great thing if you have a ton of retained earnings and cash flow. Then yeah. that's exactly what you want. But if your business is struggling, not a good idea. Scale back. Interesting. So what other advice might you offer to business owners? So I would say become able to read your financial statements and understand the events in your business that impact those numbers. Keep good control of your cash flow. Understand external and environmental impact on your business. Don't ignore that. Make a provision for that, or maybe you need to move in a different direction. Make sure you have a regular dialogue with your lenders. In you'll always hear this in good times when your business is good. You always hear this. Banks are willing to lend on <laughs> businesses that don't need money. Well, if you're in good times and things are good, get a line of credit just as insurance. You never know what's going to happen. That's an interesting piece of advice and one that's maybe particularly relevant as we keep hearing rumblings in the news about Recession. maybe an economic downturn. So, yeah. are you seeing an uptick of? of borrowing because of that? We are because the rates are so favorable. If you think a downturn is coming, and a lot of people do, and your business is in a nice position, you might want to have it in your back pocket. Yeah. Unfortunately, a lot of lenders, I don't want to say have a knee-jerk reaction, but they definitely respond to those changes, right, in the environment. So they tighten up their credit. So 
that's why I recommend doing it now. Yeah. All right. So if a small business is interested in getting funding from BCU, what's the first step they should take? So they can either call us or go on to bcu.org, and there is an application there. But they're certainly free to call. They can call me direct. Yep. All right. Well, that's an offer people should take up, take you up on. Yeah. How might they reach you? At 847-612-8073. All right, folks. I hope you're listening to that because that's an offer that doesn't come along every day. Somebody with 30-plus years of lending experience personally willing to help give you advice about the process and make sure you're steered on the right path. Any other final words, resources, uh, tools, things that you think that business owners might benefit from? You know, there's always tools online, but some are probably better than others. Well, I, I like to use bankrate.com if I'm, I'm trying to figure out an amortization schedule or see what my loan payment would be on a uh, loan. That's, that's a great good. one. They have many calculators there, and that's free. I keep track of rates through um, the Treasury, and that's the IRS.gov. Wall Street Prime, you, you know, check the website and keep track of uh, Prime just went down again. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, so great. still a so great if I'm buying a house. Yeah, it still might a great a lending time. environment. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. And BCU does a great job on their um, consumer side. And as far as tools, um, I think there are so many online, but I I really encourage people to start with SCORE and and SBA because those tools are still relevant for even conventional loans. It's amazing how many people don't even know about either of them. SBA maybe more, but SCORE is one of those organizations that kind of puzzles me. I would say nine out of 10 business people that I talked to have never heard of them before, which is kind of amazing to me, but they are a phenomenal resource. Any final words of advice and wisdom? Well, I think my final words of advice would just be that the, you know, five C's of credit are still relevant today as they've ever been, which is your credit worthiness, your character, you know, your, your collateral, your conditions. So keep all of that in mind and and be prepared when you go and you're ready to lend be prepared and it should be an easy process if you've gotten these things in order well that is some phenomenal advice folks some very useful and helpful inside tips from a lender a longtime lender who um, has seen a whole lot of business loans over the years so I, i hope that's been a benefit of you Wendy, I just want to thank you again for thank being you. on the show. It was really a pleasure having you. Thank you. And it was a lot appreciate of fun. your time and insights. Thanks so much for listening, folks. This is the Savvy Entrepreneur with WLCB. And thanks again, especially to our studio guest today, Wendy Bash, Director of Commercial Lending at BCU. Again, you can find more helpful information on my law website, forsythialaw.com, or my advisory services site, which is globalocityservices.com. There's all sorts of free blogs and tools, podcasts, webinars, and other resources. I want you to be sure to join me the following Saturday when our guest will be Eric Freibrun. He's a longtime intellectual property lawyer who's worked for some very large companies including Starbucks among others and he will be here to talk about some of the things that startups and small businesses really need to think about when it comes to protecting your intellectual property something that a lot of companies unfortunately don't pay enough attention to uh, and can come back to bite them so don't miss that because this is advice that would uh, normally cost you a bunch of money. IP lawyers are not cheap to hire, but Eric is going to be here uh, talking to you, giving his many years of experience and some free tips on how to do a better job with your intellectual property and protecting it. All right, folks, join us then. This is Doris Nagel with The Savvy Entrepreneur. Until our next show, folks, happy entrepreneuring. Entrepreneuring.